Matthew chapter 22. And we'll be looking at the first 14 verses this morning, the parable of the wedding feast, the parable of the wedding feast, Matthew 22. Reading from verse 1 through to 14, Matthew 22. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants and they were willing to come. Again he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted, uh, fatted cattle and killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all who they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Let's, um, let's pray, shall we? Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. I just pray, Lord, that you'd be with us now and help us to understand, uh, Lord, that we would see Christ and the glory of Christ in your word this morning. Be with me, Lord. Give me clarity of thought and speech and unction. Anoint me from on high, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you'd give us ears to hear, myself included. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, um, <clears throat> the parable of the wedding feast. The Bible uh, speaks much about weddings and, and marriage in general. Um, Jesus' first miracle. Anyone remember what that was? His first miracle. Water, or should I say the first recorded miracle, the water, water being turned into wine, uh, the, wed the wedding in Cana. Um, uh, we, we, we can see from scripture the, uh, the, the reality of uh, weddings. Um, they're joyous occasions, uh, a sacred occasion. Um, sometimes weddings in the scriptures and, and uh, in the kind of ancient world would last up to uh, a week or more. You know, we have a, a wedding uh, for, a, for a day, don't we? Someone's getting married and there's a day of celebration. Uh, but in the um, ancient Jewish culture, uh, they, these would be uh, events that would be um, uh, very sacred and, and, and very joyous occasions, uh, lasting, lasting more than a day often. Um, a divinely ordained union between a man and a woman. Uh, we see a picture of uh, Christ and his church in the principle of marriage, the, the bridegroom and the bride, and we'll talk about that perhaps a little bit more in our message this morning. But here we have a wedding, a wedding that the king has prepared uh, for uh, his son, this marriage for his son. The kingdom of heaven's likened unto this great wedding feast. Verse 2, it says, A king who arranged a marriage for his son. And then we see the king sending out his servants in verses 3 and 4. Um, he goes, he sends out his servants in verse 3 to invite those who were uh, called to the wedding. And then in verse 4, uh, he, he sends out a further invite. Um, as I've mentioned really just in the introduction really, but we see this picture here, the Lord sharing this parable of what it, a, a, a representation of the kingdom of heaven. 
And we know that the kingdom of heaven is this great reality that Christ has won for himself a bride, that there's a bride that's to be presented to the bridegroom, uh, Christ. And we see that uh, here, but in other areas of the scriptures, we see this principle of Christ and, and his bride. Matthew 9 speaks about Jesus uh, saying to his people when questioned about fasting, can the friends of the bridegroom, can they mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Uh, so he, he refers to himself as the bridegroom and having friends who, who will not mourn whilst he's with them. Uh, Ephesians 5, um, the Apostle Paul speaks, speaks of this principle of marriage. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So really the, the picture of marriage is really a, it's like a shadow, it's like a foreshadow of the reality of Christ and his church. It's a, it's um. A, a, div a divinely ordained uh, a sacred act that God has implemented in, in human beings between a man and a woman to represent his relationship with his people, that his, that his son would be the bridegroom and that, that the church would be the bride of Christ. In Revelation 19 verse 7, uh, John writes uh, for us, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. The church is being made ready. We're referred to as the wife of Christ. So Jesus here uses this parable <clears throat> of the wedding feast to point to this deeper significant reality of the kingdom of God and what that looks like. These who are invited to come uh, to the wedding but firstly, what does this parable tell us about the king himself? Uh, this king, um, firstly, there's a feast uh, 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 that the king has compassionately prepared. He's compassionately prepared this feast. Verse 4, he says, come to the wedding. Come to the wedding. Now, I can't imagine any of us, well, maybe I might be wrong on this, but I can't imagine any of us in here got an invite to uh, Prince William and Catherine, Catherine Middleton's wedding in uh, 2011. Um, I don't know if you got an invite through the post. I certainly didn't. Uh, but I wonder how you'd feel if you got an invite to a wedding like that. You'd probably think it was a, a hoax to start with, maybe. But if there was a genuine invite from royalty to invite you to a wedding, um, I'm sure most of us would probably make some form of effort to try and be there. We'd find that interesting. It'd be something of, of great significance. Well, Christ here is speaking of this great king of heaven, really, this parable pointing to this, to this true king of heaven, inviting his subjects to come and to feast at this wedding of his son. But even the, the marriage of the lamb, the, the wedding of, of, of heaven, the, the kingdom of God, this great wedding feast is even greater than this. We wouldn't just be there as spectators, as Christians, but to be there as the bride of Christ, those who have been set apart for Christ, those who have been uh, made without spot and blemish to be presented at, as his bride uh, to the bridegroom. What a wonderful privilege that is. It's one thing to be invited to a, uh, the, the marriage of royalty or dignitary, but to be invited to the wedding uh, of, of God himself, that we would be invited to the marriage uh, of Christ himself as his as his bride, as the church. You see, Christians are, in a sense, a love gift from the Father to the Son. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me, verse 37 and 38, says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. You see, God the Father has, has, has called a certain people to come to, and to draw and to woo a certain people to his son as a, as a love gift, so to speak. What a privilege that is. What a privilege it is that we as Christians get to be the, the recipients of, of God's great compassion and grace being given to the son by the father, but also receiving the life that Christ gives to us as his people, as the Spirit of God works in our hearts. It's more than just taking a sinful person and giving a sinful person to his Son, but taking a sinful person and changing us inwardly, changing our hearts, giving us a new heart with new desires, new affections, that the Spirit of God would work in our hearts by the love of God being poured out 
in us, in our lives. Romans 5.5 5 says, Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. What manner of love is this that God has come down not just to take his friends and present his friends to his son as their bride, but taken his enemies and changed his enemies, changed their nature, given them new hearts with new desires that we should be called children of God. What a loving God we have in heaven. One who's presented us to his son in this great wedding feast. Well, we see this king not only uh, showing compassion in the call uh, to his people, but also the preparations of the king who's made all things ready. He's made all things ready. It says in our text, the dinner, the dinner is prepared uh, in verse uh, 4, the second half of ver verse 4. He says, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. This is a prepared wedding. It's already, it's already there on the table. It's, it's, it's finished. It's a feast that's been, uh, it's been prepared and accomplished. He's prepared his dinner. All things are ready. Come to the wedding. Have you ever been to a meal where it's not ready? You, go, you get to a, a restaurant or you go to a, maybe a wedding. It would be, wouldn't, it'd be, wouldn't be a good situation in a wedding perhaps. But you go somewhere and the food's the food's not ready, it's not been cooked, and there's a lot of waiting around, and you know, it's, um, it can cause frustrations to some people, I guess, but this isn't the case with this wedding feast. It's something that's it's already, it's already there, it's ready. It's been completed. It's a finished feast. It doesn't need to have anything added to it or taken away from it. And really, the principle here of this readiness this preparedness of the feast is the reality of Christ and his finished work. When Jesus died on the cross, what did he, what did he cry out? Can you remember? It is, it is finished. The Greek there, tetelestai. It's, it's accomplished. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. It's not one of many potential different ways into the wedding feast. It's not one of a whole plethora of, of, of ideologies of where we can come to this feast of God, but it's through Christ and his finished work only that this entrance to the wedding feast can be attained. Christ is the only way. We know that very well-known verse of Scripture, John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father unless they come through me, says Jesus. Christ is the only way. It's a way that's been accomplished. It's a way that's been finished. You, you know, we, we often uh, hear this question, don't we, from the unbelieving world. Well, what, what, what has God ever done for me? You ever heard someone say that before? What's God ever done for me? Or, when, well, when God does this, then I'll believe. When God does this in the future, that's when I'll believe. But you see, God has done... All that he need, well, he doesn't, not that he even needed to do that, not that he even needed to send his son, but he's done all that he has ordained to have done in his son, Christ our King and our Lord. There isn't a second way of salvation. It's not that God has to come and do something else, but that it's been accomplished at the cross, his finished work. It's almost like people sometimes are waiting for something to drop out of the sky in order for them to be convinced or for another way to find friendship with God. But it's done through Christ. It's only through looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. When God is saying, this is prepared, this has been made ready, this is finished, it's a finished work of Calvary, when Jesus took upon himself the penalty for the sins of his people, and he's calling mankind to look to him and to live. When he says, come to the wedding in our text today, it's this idea of looking to Christ, to come to him by faith. There's a completeness about the atoning work of Christ. But not only that, it's not only that his work is completed, but there's an urgency that's attached to that. 
There's an urgency for, for, for all mankind to, to come to him, to believe upon his name. We, we use that expression sometimes, don't we, the, the, that we would have gospel urgency because there is a need uh, for the urgent uh, necessity of faith to look to Christ in urgency, to believe on him uh, today. In 2 Corinthians 6, the Apostle Paul writes, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you're ever speaking to a non-believer and they say, well, when's the best time for me to believe? Say, now, now is the best time to believe. Today is the day of salvation. Because that soft, fluffy pillow that we got our heads off of this morning is not guaranteed for anyone this evening. That's the reality of every person's life being one heartbeat away from eternity. And we must, as Christians in our gospel endeavours, we must press that urgency home as we speak with people. We must press the urgency that then no one's guaranteed, and I'm not on about being obnoxious or disrespectful, but sharing with people lovingly the reality that today is the day of salvation. There may not be another opportunity to come to this wedding, that it's an urgent uh, an urgent call from this king. It's been prepared, it's been made ready, it's been accomplished in the finished work of Christ. Now he calls men to come unto him and to look to him for this work, for this entrance to this great wedding feast. So he's the king who's made all things ready. He's the king who's spared no expenses. We see this picture of the, the oxen and the fatted uh, cattle uh, we can't help but think of the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? He goes away and he spends his inheritance and he's e eating the, the pods with the pigs and he comes to his senses and he says, I'll go back to my father. Maybe he'll have me as one of his hired servants. And he walks back and the father's waiting for him and he comes, he puts on the best ring on his fingers and the best robes on his back and he says, take the fatted calf. We're going to have a feast tonight. You see this picture of God uh, the love of God towards his people, sparing no expense. The best of the best. You know, the Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from God. If there's any good in our lives today, and there's lots of good in our lives that, we, that we're often very, myself included, very unthankful for, but there's lots of good that we should be thankful to God for. James 1 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above and comes down from the Father of lights. God is the God who gives good gifts to men. He gives good gifts to his people when he converts them. He sets captivity captive and gives good gifts to men. But you know, the greatest of all gifts is that he would send his only begotten son. This picture of the fatted cattle, this picture of the oxen, this picture of the best of the best is the reality that God the Father sent his only son into this world to take on flesh to live a life as a man, to experience suffering and humiliation, to know what it means to be betrayed by your friends, to be deserted by those who so often committed to walking with you, and then ultimately going to the cross where the Father poured out his judgment upon his Son in our place. What a cost! What a costly sacrifice! that God would give his only son. This bread who came down from heaven, that his body would be broken for the nourishment of souls. This is the requirement. The requirement for there to have been any wedding feast is the reality that the son would willingly give his life. This wasn't a result, as some uh, blasphemous leaders often say nowadays, some result of cosmic child abuse. No, Christ willingly came and lay down his life on that cross. And this is the requirement for this wedding feast, that, that the best of the best would be presented. It's one thing for some mere man to lay his life down for another man, but for God, the God of all creation, the God who has never begun and has always existed, to come into his own creation as a man and to give his life, to take upon himself the judgment, the, the wrath of God that fell on him, in our place. What a wonderful picture we see of the blessedness of God. A wonderful picture we see of the 
of the, the, the generosity of God, the kindness of God, the eternally blessed God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that have always existed in eternity past. There was this, it's known as the covenant of redemption, that the Father would send His Son, and the Son would willingly, from eternity past, come and, and make this covenant that He was going to come into the world and to give His life in the place of sinners like us. What a gracious king we have. What a compassionate king. So that people, sinful men and women, could be reconciled to God through him. Not just to be brought to God as his slaves. Yes, in one sense, as his slaves. Uh, not just as his servants. Yes, in one sense, as his servants. Yes, as his friends. But more than that. More than, more than his friends and his servants. But as his children that we would be called heirs with Christ, co-heirs with Christ. What a wonderful reality. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 says, He, <coughs> the, sorry, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. You see, that's the, Christ, the position of the Christian. Someone who has become an heir of God in Christ. That we've become co-heirs with Christ. Joined to God. What a wonderful, kind saviour that we have. You know, in this, when we talk about the, 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 the transformed life, when we talk about the, becoming an heir with Christ, that's not just something that happens when we die. That's something that happens when we get born again. That's when eternal life starts, when we're saved, when we're born of the Spirit of God. You see, often, <clears throat> often today, coming to Christ is presented in such a way that to people like, oh, do you, do you want to avoid hell? Well, come, come to Jesus and then you'll go to heaven. And there's a very real sense that that's true. But that's not ultimately the motivation for coming to Christ. Because God is worthy, Christ is worthy. That we would come to Christ, not just to avoid hell and go to heaven, but that we would now be living for what we were made for as human beings. To live for the glory of God. That we would be rooted in his purposes for our lives as his children. Joined with Christ by faith. That we would walk by faith in the blessings and the benefits of the Christian life. To know God, we were, we were praying earlier, weren't we, about God, let, let us know you more deeply and more nearly, that we would know God more deeply as his children, as he conforms us by his spirit, the washing of his word into the image of his son. You see, to be a Christian is not just, uh, it's not just oh, I want to avoid hell and go to heaven. It's that we would now be living in the, for the reason that we were made to live, for the glory of God. Romans chapter 8, verses 31, 32 what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? All things. See, God is the one who gives us good and perfect gifts, but ultimately the best of gifts is himself. It's himself. We were made as human beings for a relationship with God here and now. Not just some eternal state. Yes, for all eternity. But here and now. Eternal life starts when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're born again of the Spirit of God. When you have a child that's born in a physical sense, we don't say, oh, they, their life starts later on. Their life starts at conception. And when God does that work in our souls, that's when true eternal life starts with him so we, we see the, the compassion of this king but we also see an invite that's so sinfully rejected the king puts the king puts out his, his invite in verses 3 and, uh, and 4 He says, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to this wedding. But then verse 5, we see the response of the natural man. But they made light of it, 
and they went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. They were unwilling to come. In verse 3, we see the first call of the king. He sends out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing. You see that? They were not willing to come. If you're reading from the ESV, it just says they would not. They would not come. The idea there is there's an un, there was an unpreparedness to will to go to this wedding feast. They didn't have in mind, or they had no intention um, there would be, uh, the, the, the context here is that they, they took no delight or had no pleasure in doing so. I mean, you could understand that in some ways. We spoke earlier about being invited to a royal wedding. You know, there may be some kind of political bias and you think, oh, I don't really want to go to that wedding. You could understand that in an earthly sense. But for the, cre- the king of all creation to invite you to his wedding feast, the wedding feast of his son... To be unwilling to come to that really just exposes man's natural condition. We hear a lot today, don't we, uh, about the term free will. You hear people say, oh, well, I've got free will to do this and free will to do that. But actually the Bible speaks of, of the reality that man's will is not free, that man's will is actually enslaved to their natural conditions. I've mentioned this illustration before. It's like, a yes, man has a free will to do certain things, but those, those things are confined to what his greatest desires are, like a, like a prisoner in a prison cell. He may be able to do press-ups and make a cup of tea and do certain things, but he's still, in, he's still enslaved in that cell. He still can't break free from that cell. Mankind makes choices in line with their greatest desire. What is their, what's their most... Uh, their, mo- their greatest proclivity, what are they leaning toward the most, towards the most? And the will of mankind is enslaved. In John chapter 8, the very well-known verse, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a... What do you think? It's a slave to sin. It's a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free... You shall be free indeed. There's something, when a person comes to Christ, there's something of a, of a liberation that takes place. There's something of a freeing that takes place. And that's the idea of our will being in bondage up until conversion. That our will is enslaved. It's, we're, we're unwilling to come. The king gives out his invite for the wedding and we're unwilling to come to him in our natural condition. Man's will is by nature in hostility towards God. Romans chapter 8 again, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. It goes on in Romans 8, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind, the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those that are in the flesh cannot please God. There's an unwillingness because our will is enslaved to sin. There's a spiritual blindness that's also, that also encapsulates this enslavement. There's a, there's a real um, a reality of, of spiritual opposition, spiritual blindness. In Ephesians 2, it speaks about the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, being by nature children of wrath. And 2 Corinthians 4 speaks about the God of this age blinding the minds of unbelievers. That's a satanic um, opposition to the human race, if I put it like that. The devil's aim is to blind the minds of unbelievers. So that yes, the will of the non-believer is enslaved in a natural condition, hostile towards God, but there's also out external forces that are also blinding the minds of men and women all over the world today. These guys at the Olympics the other day, they are blinded. They, are being, they have been taken captive by Satan to do his will. They're blinded to the glory of the gospel of Christ. And they need to have their eyes opened and only the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit that gives life. And our prayer is that that would be the case for those folks. So how is this spiritual blindness, how is this will that is hostile towards God, how is this expressed here in our text today? 
Well, we see in verse 5, they made light of the invitation. They made light of it. They paid no attention to it. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you're talking with someone and you can just tell that it's not, maybe, maybe something really serious you need to talk about, you need to get a conversation, you need to discuss something. You can tell it's just going in one ear and out the other ear. And a lot of the time it's because it, it, they, they feel it has no bearing upon them. They, they're making light of it because they think, oh, well, it doesn't really involve me. It's not something I need to be aware of, not really interested in listening at the moment. But actually, this is something that's, that has eternal consequences. This wedding feast is something of eternal value. And to make light of it really expresses and shows the indifference to the call of the king in the lives of the human race, ultimately. Treating casually the glory of Christ. This king has a son who's about to be, who's, who's going to be married. And, 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 he, and he, he compassionately invites folks from the, from the city and they treat it as light. They have no care. They're indifferent to the cause of this king. Treating casually the glory of Christ. This one who, it says they, they went to their farms and their businesses. These farms and these businesses are given to them by the king. Jesus is the one who gives us these things. And yet we treat these things of greater value. He's now treated with contempt Christ is the one. He's the reason for not only the businesses and the farms and the things that we're involved with, he's the reason for the existence of this world. This world exists not just because God was lonely one day and wanted to make some, make some human beings. This world exists for Christ to come into and to go to a cross to redeem himself a bride for all eternity, that he would be glorified in a people that have been saved by the grace of God, as Ephesians says, to the praise of his glorious grace. So it's expressed in an indifference. We treat light, eternal, things with eternal consequences, we treat as light. I don't know if you've ever seen Ray Comfort, this uh, evangelist from America. He'll often ask people the question and say, would you, would you sell one of your eyes for a million pounds? And people say, no, I wouldn't, sell, I wouldn't sell one of my eyes. He said, would you sell both of them for 10, 10 million pounds? Would you sell both of your eyes? And they'd say, no, I wouldn't. There's no amount of money you can give me for me to sell my eyes. And he says, it's because you place value in your eyesight, right? You, you, it's, not, it's not about the money. It's the fact you value your eyes. So how much more concern should you give to your eternal soul? And yet we treat it indifferently. We often treat our souls indifferently. We, we, we almost like, we, want, we get everything else in our lives sorted. We place value on education, finances, uh, social, political reform, whatever it may be. Uh, all these different things, we get our ducks in a row and then we take care of our spiritual life kind of somewhere down there on the list. But actually, our walk with Christ should be primary. That should be the primary focus of who we are as Christians, is to be abiding in him. We can't be fruitful unless we abide in the vine of Christ. You see, this invite wasn't received by these folks, not just because the will was hostile, not just because they lacked that an indifference concerning the glory of God and the cause of the King, but also because there's a, there was a love for this world. Their will was enslaved, really, to a love for darkness and self-glorification. And how does that express itself in our text? Well, verse 5b, they made light of the invitation and they went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. Essentially, they treated the things of this world greater and with greater importance than the, than the wedding feast of the king. First John 2, we read this the other week, says, if anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. See, anything in our lives that takes the place of God, anything in our lives that we value and, and consider worthy over and above the God of heaven, 
is idolatry. And that's a very dangerous place to be in. And you know, we can go into churches, we can sit in pews week after week, but God, God sees our hearts. He knows what we value. He knows what takes primary place in our hearts. Do you remember the rich young ruler? What must I do to be saved? Oh, uh, on a, on a, your mother and father, he went through a list of the commands and all these I have done from my youth. And Jesus saw this man's idol, his covetousness, his love of money, and he placed his finger straight on it. He said, go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. He saw this man, he saw where his priorities were and he says he went away sad. One of the saddest verses, I, I think, from Scripture, 2 Timothy 4, do you remember when the Apostle Paul says, Demas... Demas has forsaken me. Can you remember what you forsook him for? He's forsaken me for, for having loved this present world. Having loved this present world, he forsook Paul. And that, we don't, I mean, we don't, in, in, in all honesty, we don't know the full outcome of Demas, but I, we, can, we can assert from Scripture that this was not good for him. We can assert from Scripture that he forsook Paul and therefore he forsook God and he went off into this present world and we see this with people all the time don't we you, you, you see men and women in the faith and they're running hard they're, 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 they're seeking the Lord they're running after Christ and then a new hobby comes in or, or a new, uh, maybe they come into some money or something something takes, takes hold of their hearts begins to grip them maybe even, even things that God can give us like children, there's things in our lives where we begin to place more importance and we begin to treat things as idols over and above our love for God himself. And then the affections begin to grow cold. Our love for God begins to grow cold. And then in years down the line, these people have fallen from the faith because they've gone after the things of the world. Is that us today? Is there anything in your life today that you think, I'm not sure whether this has got a grip of my heart. I'm not sure whether I'm, whether I'm placing, I'm worshipping this more than I'm worshipping Christ, more than I'm worshipping God. Is there anything that, that is taking that place, the throne of our hearts this, this morning? Maybe over the last few months or years, there's something that's, there's something that's taken hold and we've begun, we've begun to grow cold towards the things of God because our affections have been divided. I just encourage you today, just put it down. Just turn from it and run to Christ. Put it in its rightful order. Again, many of these things aren't bad. It's not bad to, for example, have money or to have hobbies or to do different things that the Lord's brought in our path. But the danger is when we, we love those things more than God himself. So we see a heart that is refusing an invite. Well, how does the king respond to those who refuse him, those who reject his invite? Well, firstly, he responds with fury. Verse 7. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. He was furious. Brothers and sisters in Christ, don't, don't think that God is indifferent towards your sin. When you commit sin, it's not something, God is not indifferent to it. He doesn't treat it lightly. Especially as Christians, the Bible speaks about this idea of trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. God is not indifferent towards what took place at the Olympics the other day or towards most of the human race which rejects him and curses him to his face. God is not indifferent about these things. In fact, the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 36, that the wrath of God abides over the non-believer. Those who are outside of Christ, the wrath of God is abiding over them, ready to fall at any point upon them. But his fury is not like our fury. Our fury is often sinful. Our anger is often tainted with selfishness and prideful ways. You know, we get cut up in a traffic queue and we think we're righteously justified to be honking our horns. We're, uh, God's fury is not like our fury. The fury of this king. He's not, uh, he's, not, um, he's not furious because people have upset him. But God's wrath his really his, express, his, his expressed righteous justice. 
the expression of his righteous justice towards all that is contrary to his nature, anything that is sinful. His fury is set to be unleashed. And he, what did he do? Verse 7b, he sent out his armies and he destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Now notice there he says their city, singular. This is very much an indictment upon the Jews as, as Jesus was speaking here in the first century Jewish culture. And we see the dispossession of the Jews in 70 AD where that city was literally destroyed. And Jesus prophesied that just a few chapters later in Matthew. He said, this generation won't pass away till all these things take place. We see the, the taking down of the temple. Literally within that generation, we see that city destroyed, showing really the accuracy of Christ's prophetic teaching here in this parable and the faithfulness of God's character. He's the king who calls. He's the king who calls effectually. They rejected his people. Those who brought the message to them. It says that they destroyed... Um, sorry, when, when, when the, the message was brought to them, it says that they seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. We see there a picture of the Old Testament prophets. They brought the truth of God down to bear upon the people. And yet God, and yet they, and yet they killed those prophets. These, these um, Jews that should have been entrusted with the oracles of God, they should have been trusted as the people of God. They rejected God's revelation to them. They rejected his Messiah. They rejected his son. And ultimately they rejected the invite that, he, that the king had laid out for them to come to this wedding. So what we see, what do we see as a result of this rejection? Did the king cancel the wedding? Well, certainly not. We see really the picture of the gospel age. The good news of this wedding feast going out all over the land. The king's instructions to his servants in verse 9, go to the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. Now the highways, when you have a city and you have the roads, the main roads that are going out of the city, you have a picture here of the, the message being taken outside of the city. It's no longer confined to the city of Jerusalem. It's no longer just to the Jewish uh, theocratic nation of Israel. But now this message is being spread out down the highways and the hedges. All those who are, uh, who are down the highways of the city going out. Uh, we see this, real, this picture really here, the Lord expressing this reality of the gospel age. And that's what took place. Just a, just a, few, uh, a few months or years later, we see the, the gospel going out to every nation. And here we are 2,000 years on, living thousands of miles away from where this message was preached. And the gospel is, is running forth from, from sea to sea. The gospel age of the good news of Christ to every tribe and every nation. We see folks beginning to come to the wedding. In verse 10 it says, the wedding hall was filled with guests. It wasn't just a few guests, not just a trickle here or there. We know, that, we know that the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. But the reality is we see this hall, this wedding feast filled with guests. Folks, folks coming from every tribe and tongue and nation. God bringing his elect from the four corners of the world. This wedding hall being filled with uh, the idea there is that there's an expression that not, not one of them that will be lost. You know Jesus, it said, when the angel came to Mary and Joseph, they said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. There isn't one that's going to be lost. Remember John chapter 6, verse 40, this is the will of him who sent me, said Jesus, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Praise God that we have a Saviour who does the will of his Father in heaven. Praise God that we have a Saviour who saves his people from their sins. It says in verse 14, many are called, but few are chosen. We see here this distinction really between the general call of the gospel and the effectual call of the gospel. You see, you may be in a, 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 a meeting or when we go out to Glasgow or into the streets and we share the good news of Christ. God is going to use his word 
to save his people. That's the means by which he saves. The gospel is his power unto salvation. Now everybody there, maybe there's 20 people, let's say you have a revival meeting, there's a hall filled of 100 people. Everybody there is listening, there's a general call that goes out. But as that call goes out, God is working in the hearts of his people. There's an effectual call that takes place. Many are called, but few are chosen. You see, God is the one who chooses his people from eternity past. It's not about what we have done. It's about who he is. He chooses his people. It's about his, or his sovereign grace. And, it, and not only does he choose his people, but he clothes his people. Now, just finally, as we come to a close, we see here this king clothing his people. Those who he, choose, who he chooses, he also clothes. Verse 11 and 12, But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did, who did not have on a wedding garment, and he said, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now, in some traditions, this wedding garment would be the garment that the guests would wear. It wouldn't just be the bride and groom that get dressed up, but the, the guests there would, would wear these garments in the wedding. But you see, we have garments as Christians, and our garments are the righteous robes of Christ. And it's not something that we can work for. It's not something that we earn or deserve. Notice how when that, when that call went out to the, the highways, it said, call them to come in, even the bad and the good. God doesn't discriminate. He doesn't look down and say, well, so Pete's a nice person, so I'm going to give him a wedding garment. I'm going to give him the righteousness of my son. No, he sees an object that deserves judgment, but, but yet at the same time, an object that he has a person that he has ordained unto eternal life from eternity past. That we would have the righteous robes of Christ. You see, that's the righteousness. The robes of Christ are the only righteousness that's acceptable on the day of judgment. If we stand, we're either going to stand in this great wedding feast, if I could put it like that, wearing the righteous robes of Christ, or we'll stand looking like ourselves. It's known as the imputed righteousness of Christ. We need his righteousness given to us. It's not about any merit that is found within us, anything that we deserve. If God was to give us what we deserve, then we would all go to hell because we all deserve hell. Let's just be, let's be honest with ourselves. That's what we deserve. But God has given us what we don't deserve, the righteousness of his son, because his son took our judgment in our place. And we see, just finally now, we see this one, this one who's standing in there. And this is a fearful passage. Verse 11, he, the king comes in to the hall and he sees the guests. He sees those clothed in the wedding garments, the true bride of Christ. And it says, yet he saw a man there who didn't have on a wedding garment. It would be like, um, imagine like a military parade and everybody's there in a, in a uniform, a soldier's outfit, and the, and, the, and the captain's going down the line, and then all of a sudden there's a guy there standing in a, like a clown outfit. He, he would stick out like a sore thumb. That would be the reality of trying to make it into heaven on your own good works, on your own righteousness. Firstly, we see it was too late. He's in the feast and he hasn't got a garment on. He hasn't been given a garment by the king in the right way. It's too late for him. There's no going back. There's no patching things up. You see, there are many folks who believe that they're going to sort things out with God when they die, or I'll take care of that, or I've just got to get this sorted first. I've got to know that I can't. You know, we talked earlier about giving up those things that hold our affections. People try to keep hold of those, and they think one day I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to put that to one side and I'm going to get right with God. But you see, that's not how it works. Because today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You can't patch things up with God on the other side of eternity. Once death comes, it's over. And this man was in this hall and he had no garment. And he was without excuse. Verse 12, it says he was speechless. The king said to him, where's your... Let's have a look at it, shall we? Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. 
In Romans 3 it says, Now whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. See, that's what the law of God does. It shuts the mouth. When you hold your, your life in light of the mirror of God's word and you see where it says all liars will have their part in a lake of fire and we think about our own lives, it, it's, it's, the law is designed to close the mouth. And here's this man, he's speechless. He's got no response. He's got no garment. He knows that he shouldn't be in this place. And then ultimately and finally he was judged for his sin. Not just, not just the other servants who, who had the city destroyed, not just the city that was destroyed, but now this individual who's cast into outer darkness. We see verse 13, Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot. Bind him hand and foot. Think about how that would, may look. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We see here this reality of the, of the judgment of hell that awaits all those who, not only those who reject the king's invite, but those who try to make it in looking like themselves. And there are many people, in, even in amongst the professing church today, they may look very moral on the outside, they may have the garments of self-righteousness, the garments of religious tradition, the garments of evangelical form, they know how to say the right things in all the right places, but they haven't got on the garments of Christ's righteousness. They've never truly come and bowed the knee to King Jesus. And I'd just encourage you, if you haven't done that today, I mean, my hope and my prayer is that everyone in here has done that, but the reality is it's only God sees the heart. And we need to be a people that have truly yielded our lives to Christ that we would be wearing and clothed in the righteous garments of Christ. Are you clothed in Christ's righteousness today? I'm not asking you, are you religious? I'm not even asking you, are you, do you profess to know Jesus? The question is, have you been joined by faith in union with Christ in, in his death, burial and resurrection? Do you know the life of the Spirit of God in your soul today? Have you been born again? Do you know for sure that you will be part of this great wedding feast that is due for each one of those who are his? What a merciful king we have. What a gracious and compassionate king. He's prepared this feast. He's given his son the best of the best. And he calls us to come to him today to receive him by faith that we may know that reality of not just being a guest at, 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 at the king's wedding but being joined to the king's son as his bride and being joined in union with him. Amen. Well, let's, let's pray, shall we? Let's pray.